just uh, orient you to the panelists who are sitting uh, to my left on, on your right, Mike Adams from Constellation uh, Energy, and then David Wells, who is here from Kleiner Perkins, uh, and then uh, to his left, um, we have Zach Schulman, who is down from Ithaca, uh, with relationships both at Cornell, teaching in the law school and business school, and a partner at Cayuga uh, Partners. And then Larry Thomas, the CEO of Primate Materials. And then David Ye, who's a uh, private investor and, uh, um, and previously a, a venture capitalist. Uh, we have a lot of material to cover, so we're going to uh, get into the discussion about scaling to growth in clean tech. It's been a big challenge, and uh, we're very fortunate to have so many perspectives here to share with you tonight. Let me jump into some questions that were asked of me when uh, we expressed the interest to get this panel together and about uh, what is going on. And one of the first questions that was asked is kind of one of the, the endpoint questions, which is uh, where, where are the early exits in clean tech? And uh, where do you see those happening? Uh, what are the targeted technologies? Where are, what are the business models? Um, and who are the customers? And then uh, if you could comment on uh, what the exit vehicles look like, uh, corporate acquisitions or IPOs, uh, others including moving a company overseas. Um, what kind of timing? What are we looking at here in the 2011 uh, time frame, especially? Maybe some things in 2012. And uh, what kind of deal sizes are we looking at? So um, I think we will we'll start off by uh, taking this from my left and then going down. And uh, I look forward to your comments. Thank you. I'll pick up on business models first. I think business models is an interesting problem for a lot of clean tech companies, mainly because they're very different depending upon your technology and how and, and, and where it's deployed. So it's almost um, you, you determine the customer first. And then you can dev develop the business model around it. You know, um, things that. So, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how what you know how what Constellation thinks about uh, how we think about business models and things we we try and replicate. So business models that work that we're looking for technologies to plug into that we can we can replicate again. Um, everyone knows well sort of the rooftop solar business in the U.S. at the moment. Um, the technologies there are fairly well known at this point. Uh, you know, PVs or thin film on the rooftops. Yeah, subsidized either through uh, you know, state RPSs or other rebates in states. Um, the model, the business model that works for that particular technology is um, a, a, a provider such as Constellation and, and others in the space um, develop the project, finance the project, and the, the customer who uh, owns the site is actually the purchaser of power off of that, um, off of the, uh, the, the panels that sit on the rooftop. Very interesting business model. That, Constellation take credit for it. It's, you know, actually, startup companies who developed that model uh, that we replicated, but we uh, we point to that as for distributed generation as a sector, one type of business model that works and is uh, is interesting to see if you can replicate that, um, particularly with distributed generation. But the models I would say vary a lot across spaces, and uh, hopefully we get into some more as we, as we talk. Thank you. Uh, Great. Uh, thanks to uh, Mary and the MIT Enterprise Forum for having me. Um, early and exit aren't two words that have generally gone together with venture investing in green tech. Um, I think uh, the venture community got pretty excited about green tech back in 2005 and piled in without giving a lot of thought to how much capital it would take to actually build big businesses in the field. and. Um, then we had uh, a little bit of a uh, shakeout. Um, people might remember Lehman Brothers, things like that. And everyone suddenly realized that uh, there were not going to be 100 biofuel companies going to scale. And the entire venture community then swung the other direction and wanted to invest only in things that were software and didn't require $100 million first plants and things like that. So it's been quite a lot of. Uh, whiplash actually in green tech investing and anything that requires significant capital to get to scale. So in that scenario, we really haven't seen much in the way of early exits except with a small handful of IPOs of technologies that found their way through the eye of the needle 
or uh, a few fire sales here and there where the basic technology was actually pretty solid and significantly de-risked, but the venture funders couldn't find the capital to bring it to commercial scale and found a strategic that was interested in doing so. Um, I think what's exciting now is the pace at which green tech is developing in China and to a less uh, public extent in India as well. And these are geographies where they're keenly aware of the challenges around energy sustainability and where there's a lot of inexpensive capital available uh, to approach scaling these technologies. So I think we're going to see um, development of new models where um, innovation in the U.S. is going to actually move for commercialization at an earlier stage abroad. And we've seen several such opportunities ourselves. Certainly we have portfolio companies that are planning on doing their manufacturing in China <coughs> to a large extent. Um, so that's, that's my bit on early exits. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'll start out by saying that I'm a recovering lawyer, so my, my comments tend to be a little more simply stated um, in terms of reality. I, I think that uh, I don't really see clean tech as very different than any, any other sector in that you have to have customers that want your products. And uh, absent some bubble, which I think is already gone in clean tech, things get a lot easier when you have customers. Um, it makes it easier to raise money. Um, it makes it easier to be patient. Um, Larry is one of our CEOs of one of our companies, which is clearly a clean tech company, which he'll tell you about. We've been in that company since 2005, and I'm guessing it'll be a few more years before we even think about an exit, actually. And that's fine. Um, it, it's kind of the mantra going in. It's sort of like drug development. It just takes a long time. Um, there, are, there are different types of clean tech investors, and David at the end will tell us, I think, more about that, where you can have some faster exits in the IT space, maybe. Um, but at the traditional you know, brick and mortar, build a factory, make some products, sell them to producers here or in China or India. It takes a while to get, to get that exit done, and without customers, it goes nowhere. Okay. And I'm Larry Thomas, and I'm with Primate Precision Materials. And again, I have to be careful here because I've got one of my board members and largest <laughs> investors to my right. I'm really nice. And, and then I was in his partner's office in San Francisco last week trying to make him one of my new investors. So uh, forgive me if I edit a little bit. Um, I, I think one of the things when you say clean tech, people have certain models in their mind. And these are the highest profile companies are ones that have very significant capital requirements. It's companies that need to go out and buy a defunct auto plant and the hundreds of millions of dollars of capital associated with that or some of these companies that want to you know, pave the Mojave Desert in solar reflectors for a couple you know, significant billions of dollars. That's not everything out there. There is, uh, in the words of uh, you know, Dow Chemical CEO, capital light ways of going after this. And that's where my company comes in. We have a low capital, low operating cost method of making specialty <coughs> materials. In our case, the electrode materials that go into lithium ion batteries. So if we can drive low cost through the battery value chain, that's of obvious and immediate benefit to the auto OEMs. We're looking at $20,000 battery packs going into cars that are supposed to sell for $20,000. Uh, what I want to react to, though, in, in your question, though, was the question of business model. And, and it's one of these questions that you're always asked when you're in my position by gentlemen like this. It's, what's your business model? What's your business model? And this obsession over defining the business model. Uh, I spent most of my career at very large companies, Dow Chemical, Air Products and Chemicals, multi-billion dollar companies. And you got really, really tired of 10 guys from Austin coming in and telling you how they were going to do business with your company. And what I found is that if you've got a technology that the market wants and you have confidence in that technology and its utility in the marketplace, you can let the business model take care of itself later. There are certain companies out there that want to do business with you as an arm's length supplier, others that want to own the productive assets and would have to be a licensee, others that are only interested in doing business with you if they acquire a piece of your company or all of it. If you try to dictate that up front, 
you're just naturally cutting the amenable market that you can go after, which is something that you can't afford to do in an early stage company. So I, I think there's something of this fallacy, again, of, of capital intensity and this fallacy of this business model obsession uh, that I, I'd encourage you to think twice about. Um, thank you, Mary, for having me. And um, I think for me, the question is not really about early exits, but are these profitable exits? Now, touching upon uh, my, my colleagues' comments is that why are you people always asking about the business model? Is that as a financial investor, you want to know how to make money, and that's the business model is your outline how to make money. But I think the, the key thing about this whole question about early exits is shouldn't, I wouldn't use the word early. I would f ask two questions. Are these profitable exits for the financial uh, investors? And then second thing, for the companies that, that have IPO'd in the clean tech space in the last few years, are these producing sustainable long-term companies that can be ongoing entities and have strong business models that can run on their own? And I think when you kind of look at some of the IPOs of the last few years, you have a lot of companies that A, weren't sustainable, or B, they couldn't raise money in the private markets and they used the public markets as an exit. At what point uh, are people seeing in, in a company's uh, life uh, or a technology's life, are, um, are you seeing trying to get involved? Uh, we've heard about manufacturing. We've heard about um, cheap capital. Um, and then how is that changing both the, uh, the, the way the company is operating day to day and also you know, how, the, how the board's working? Um, uh, that and and uh, what if any are the s wh wh what is the nature of the structure of the deals if there's any kind of pattern to that and David if you could if you could start that that would be great. Okay. Um, most of my experience is necessarily with cross border deals and I think that's what uh, Mary is hinting at. But from my own experience of uh, investing in China is that there's more enough opportunities in China to be funded by ch Chinese companies that that doesn't necessarily need Western capital. But I think what China's, what Mary's asking about, how does this impact the U.S.? Right now, I don't know what the last count is, what, there's about three trillion of foreign reserves uh, being held by the Chinese government. And now, right now, this capital is essentially a strategic asset for China to come invest in the U.S. And I think the, the big step for China to make a big impact on the U.S. clean tech market is they have to get past a, a Chinese concept that they want full control, full control of the company. I don't think minority ownership is something that most Chinese companies would be comfortable with. And at least for the companies that I deal with, there's a lot of demand for the products in China. Um, and I think it's great. Uh, I, I would never turn down a big customer in China. You have to be careful with IP. Uh, people are, are very concerned about I, IP protection in China. Even if we have patents filed in China, it's questionable as to how they'll be enforced. Um, and if you ask me as a VC, if I care about that, I mean, my answer is yes, I care, but I care more about getting the cu about getting the good customer. Um, so, it, we have our, we have all of our companies that do business in China have patents filed in China or patents issued in China. That's great. What else can they do? I don't think they can do anything else um, except get the customers in China. That's why we file the IP protection there. Um, so, um, it makes a lot of sense, and there's there's just a huge demand, um, and uh, whether or not the the, the sales to the Chinese customers are actually sales of products or whether it's licensing of technology. You can imagine which one's safer from an IP perspective, which would typically be the sale of a product um, that can't be reverse engineered. Um, it remains to be seen. Again, it just depends on the company, but I, I'm all for China. Um, I think it can't be avoided. Uh, so the, I can draw <clears throat> two examples, one, one from my own portfolio and one from a venture that we've been diligencing for investment. Uh, my portfolio company, we actually recruited the CEO uh, from uh, his position as head of the Chinese unit of a multinational company. And we brought him into a pre-product, pre-revenue startup to accelerate uh, that venture. And he responded by immediately opening a subsidiary in China to source materials and components there. And uh, there is no way that we can be competitive with this venture's innovation unless we use the lower cost of capital and lower cost of labor that feeds through into the lower cost of components that we can source in China. It's 
we'd be surrendering our, uh, a significant portion of our competitive edge in this venture if we didn't take advantage of that. Um, and I think that's going to be true in many ventures that are hardware or device based or dependent. Um, we're, we, we can't uh, operate independently of that influence from China. Uh, so the other example is a venture I'm diligencing. It's a very early stage venture. They've demonstrated their technology only at a lab bench um, status. And uh, they will have to uh, develop uh, a tool to manufacture it at larger scale, as well as conduct some pretty complex business development uh, and uh, relationship building to get into manufacturing and be commercial. And they were, um, they have ties to China through the team at the venture. And a Chinese municipality offered them free land, uh, $40 million in cash on a valuation double what any US VC would pay, and uh, basically 0% financing to build a factory on the free land in China. Um, it's pretty hard to compete against that as a venture investor trying to deliver a return <coughs> to our LPs. Um, so that's uh, another good example of how, how China's uh, participation in the game is going to change the, change the state of play. I know there's a lot of uh, conversations going on around manufacturing and uh, um, where products have to be sourced um, and they can be sourced cheaper in China. And there is a opportunity to have strategic relationships with uh, the manufacturers. Um, as either an investor or as a uh, redistributor, have have you seen any of any of those relationships? And I, 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 um, uh, I'm not talking about um, David, as you're saying the um, the U.S. funding of Japan of of Chinese business expansion in China, but rather mm -hmm. taking U.S. technology and through a strategic partnership, um, looking at distribution uh, opportunities leveraged through a manufacturing. I've, I think this is maybe not, in a sense, a, a clean tech question. This is more of a uh, growing Chinese market question. Because you know, China, till recently, was seen as uh, the world's factory. And now, in the last few years, it's seen as the only center for growth and maybe the, the, the hope to save the, the world from global recession due to this growing middle class. And what I've seen successful hasn't really been clean tech. It's just simple, large Fortune 500s going to China and basically forming JVs with, with Chinese partners to make products and services for local Chinese consumption. And there will be clean tech components to it, um, but to be honest, I think a lot of it will be around simple things like energy and cars, and <coughs> which may be electric cars. So you've heard things what GE's doing and GM's doing. So that's most of my experience. What I've seen in the venture world, I've seen some companies doing what uh, David's mentioned, where they basically offshore operations, whether it be R&D and manufacturing to China because of the lower cost of capital. But with that, of course, there are always risks. And um, I, th I think it, it's good doing a, I think in order to fully exploit the, the Chinese market, whether for its manufacturing confidence or to access its domestic market, you need a local partner. Um, I would never go to China without a local partner. You'll, you will not return your capital whatsoever. But, um, <coughs> you know, I think the, the basic structure now is, you know, you, you have 50-50 you have JVs. I think now there's, a before there was, now there's a lot more flexibility where some of the uh, Western partners can have fuller ownership of some of these JVs, maybe go 60-70. But again, that depends if these are strategically important industries for the Chinese government. So I think, I think my question, or maybe my answer to this, is that you know, yeah, JVs are the best way to go. Um, they're being done in the energy and infrastructure, and it's more at the Fortune 500 level than at the clean tech level, though. Um, and there is ha things happening at the kind of venture and startup level as well. Before the audience gets the wrong idea, it's worth saying that we don't invest in Europe without a local partner either. Uh, from our standpoint, we chose to focus on the lithium battery industry, about a third of which globally is in China. Yeah. Uh, and even just a couple years ago, you would compare a Japanese or Korean plant for making batteries, and they're very highly automated systems. And in China, you would go into plants and see people literally rolling <coughs> cylindrical batteries by hand on a, uh, a little spinning wheel. 
uh, and that's changing rapidly. You're seeing uh, the the, uh, the the quality of the manufacturing in China on a, on a lithium battery is a very high tech device to manufacture, uh, rapidly uh, gaining in scale. From our standpoint as a supplier to that industry, uh, what it means is that at least for now, the barrier for entry to be a supplier to a Chinese company is much lower than it is for a Japanese company because it's a less sophisticated manufacturing environment that we're selling to. Therefore, the qualification is a lot faster. What you have to keep in mind is that all of those conversations start with the large Chinese battery company saying to you, oh, we'll be perfectly happy to buy from you at the port because they know that your sensitivity coming in is on IP protection. But they also know that eventually you will have to land a plant in the country in order to be competitive. And they know that the government laws will compel you to start transferring more and more IP into that local plant. And you have to have a strategy for how you're going to deal with that because you will, yes, be able to do business at the port for some period of time. But you have to be thinking, all right, how do I start peeling back and landing the least critical parts of my IP in succession in the country, <coughs> keeping as much of it offshore for as long as you can, so that by the time you have to reveal that last card to your local partner, you've already moved on to the next technology that differentiates and moves your company forward. What technologies are, are you seeing, um, you know, Mike, both from, you know, an internal project uh, 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 perspective and then also from other investors' uh, perspectives? Where are you seeing the role of utilities in terms of what technologies or stage of development um, is on your radar? Uh, and um, what, what is the role of the utilities um, uh, in, in both in, if at all, in, in, in uh, providing investment into these uh, uh, smaller businesses or um, in terms of uh, uh, any other kinds of um, uh, deal considerations that you have about a company that might not ordinarily um, or otherwise uh, uh, have to have to be prepared to uh, uh, be um, be structured to to be a supplier. Uh, I guess if you drew the drew the chart of um, how innovation happens over time, and you go from research lab to early stage development to late stage development commercialization, um, you think of where utilities are on the spectrum. They aren't on it at all. And that's kind of been the problem, you know, the, the history of, of utilities in the U.S. is that's just a, a big problem. You know, the incumbents in this space never uh, tried to address innovation. Um, you know, part of it's a byproduct of policy being being regulated by PUCs who are very risk averse on behalf of ratepayers. Um, some of it is just uh, an engineering culture that that is is more about operations and execution than it is about about innovation. Um, but I think what um, what Constellation believes, and, and we see some others uh, like us uh, trying to do, is be better about engaging um, uh, innovative companies. Companies are bringing new technologies to market, and, uh, and and think about how that sets you apart from your peers. I, I think it also helps to sort of distinguish between uh, regulated utilities and really merchant energy companies or independent power producers, however you want to think about it, uh, or however you want to say it. There's, there are different incentives for, for, uh, for those two categories of, of big energy companies. So everyone thinks about utilities, you think about the people who own the wires to get you the power to your home. Most of those are distributed utilities, uh, distribution utilities, excuse me, um, who are regulated by, a, by some state level uh, entity. Um, they're going to be much slower to adapt uh, uh, technologies. In, in that particular sector, you see things related to um, grid automation, the smart grid space, quote unquote, uh, generally, you see them more uh, you know, looking in that space, but they're going to look for, um, you know, companies with a big name behind it. So they're much more likely to buy from a, a Siemens or a GE than they are from um, a, a new meter main, a new meter maker or, a, you know, an in-home display device like a Control 4. They're less likely to buy that than they would someone uh, with a company with a big name behind it that they that they trust. Um, on the generation side, so away from sort of the consumption side and the utility scale, the generation side, I think there's there's a few merchant energy companies out there who are willing to be more aggressive, and, but it's you typically see it at a, at a much later stage in development. Um, I'll point to uh, you know NRG uh, stepping up to, to sponsor Bright Source Energy, which is a large um, um, you know concentrated solar uh, thermal plant that uh, planned in, in California. Um, 
that is significantly de risked to borrow a phrase from Dave, uh, for them at, at the stage of development it is, but you can see that you know, for, the, for them, that uh, you know, later stage is something they're willing to do. So uh, hopefully that answered all parts of that question. Yeah. Um, is there anything that a, um, uh, a company coming up with a new technology uh, could do to make it more amenable to the more aggressive um, utility players? I'll speak from Constellation's perspective um, on its own. I, I don't purport to represent all utilities everywhere, but from Constellation's perspective, um, we operate in competitive markets, and that enables us to provide wholesale power to, um, to, to large distribution utilities and to end-use customers. Um, New York is actually a state that is, is competitive. Um, so for, for us, when we're looking at technologies, um, it, it really is, it's, back to an earlier point, it's really about who's the customer for this? And can I bring this to customers I currently have? That, that's usually how we're thinking about, um, you know, how we're thinking about technologies. And so it really helps to have a, a customer who will stand up and vouch for your technology and say, yes, I used it here, so I used it here, so it either A, saved me money, or B, produced power, or uh, whatever the other benefit was that the customer sees. Um, having that obviously helps, which is, you know, I think, probably the same thing that a, that a, a venture investor might say helps a lot. Um, it, it, you know, I would say that for us, having a big name behind you as a, as a partner isn't per se necessary. Um, we're trying to be better about, about taking risks on smaller stage companies, um, but it's really about, you know, it, to us, it's more about the customer base than it is about, um, you know, having a big partner or having a name behind you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have great relationships with utilities. Um, we want to speak to them so that we understand where their pain points and needs are and they want to speak with us so that they understand what the innovation pipeline looks like in their field. That said, there is a pretty wide divide in our mindsets. The, the fundamental utility mindset is uh, we're here to keep the lights on. And uh, that's a very different mindset from a venture investor and, and entrepreneurs who are there to disrupt markets. And the, the regulated utilities have no interest in innovation at all, as, as uh, Michael was saying. Um, they're just following the rules and obeying the PUCs and uh, trying to look ahead to how they're going to keep the lights on 5, 10, 15 years down the road. The, the unregulated entities have a bit more of a nimble um, mindset um, because they um, are actually having to compete for their business. And um, they're a little more forward leaning on looking at innovations and looking to see how they can take market share five, 10, or 15 years down the road. And there's another issue around the utilities, which is they're, they're, they're really only responsive to, in term, uh, the regulated entities, they're only really responsive to regulatory pressure. So when the PUCs come out with energy efficiency programs and with a set of rules to make it revenue or, or profit neutral to the regulated entities, then they act then they want to survey the landscape and see what's the best way they can fulfill that rule. But it never occurred to them to front run the rule. And why would they? It doesn't make any sense. So it's, it's really going to be a very long transition into um, a, 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 an electric grid in this country with a set of stakeholders that is primarily oriented towards um, using innovation as a tool to bring energy sustainability to the country. It's, it's a multi-decadal mission. Uh, I'll just add one thing. I, yeah. Hearing, hearing <laughs> these guys talk make, makes you want to get some utilities as LPs. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be very passive investors. We talked a little bit about India um, and I um, just want to spend a, a, a couple of minutes um, with what your perspective is on that. We've talked a lot about China uh, and about the uh, utility, uh, the, the role of the American utility uh, player, but, but what, where do you see uh, the role of India in this, in, 
uh, U.S. technology companies scaling to growth? Who goes first? Do you want business in India? India? Go ahead. I don't do. I, by default, so we have we have one company um, that actually does some business in India, and it's really interesting. Um, they're taking a waste product, uh, which is basically the fibers left over from processing sugar and, sh and, and sugar cane, and they're making with that waste product what's basically a wood replacement. Um, think about particle board uh, made without any formaldehyde whatsoever uh, that you could eat if you were really hungry. I, I don't suggest it. Um, uh, that is bio completely biodegradable, so it's not good for an outside application because it, if it got wet, it would degrade like wood. But for an indoor kitchen, think about cabinets or ceiling tiles. Or, and uh, so th this company actually has an investor from India um, that has a lot of sugar plantations. And they're, they're going to be using and starting facilities in, in India taking advantage of this waste stream. So there's, and if, who, who's been to India? Raise your hands. So we know there's lots of waste in India. Um, and the waste streams are come in various flavors. And this one actually is a very productive use of this waste stream. Um, it's called uh, sugarcane bagasse. There's actually bagasse in Florida. It's just, it's just what's left of the, of the sugarcane when it's done being squeezed. Um, and it typically just gets burned, okay, which is terrible for the environment. Now we can actually use that waste stream uh, to make this great particle board replacement, which is completely uh, non-carcinogenic um, and uh, pretty easily made. So I think, if, from my perspective, again, it's quite limited, but taking advantage of, of uh, the situation, this company is going to actually do, do well in India, which means they'll do well here um, in terms of revenue. So, well, At the risk of being quoted by our Dow Jones writer over here, uh, <laughs> I mean, China is clearly playing a mercantilist state policy direction here, and it's good to be the king. Uh, India is a democracy. They're, they're investing less in infrastructure, and they're moving much more slowly, <coughs> and they do not have this mercantilist directive from the top to own these markets. So I think we will see pretty substantial um, utilization of energy innovations in India to supply the needs of the population there for energy. It's just going to happen in a less directed, less organized, and less outwardly mercantilist directed way. Um, but they will be a significant player both as a manufacturer and a consumer and maybe as an innovator as well. What the role is that you are seeing of strategic partners uh, with the clean tech companies that you're uh, involved in or buying from um, uh, funding uh, or running? Uh, the um, one of the questions about strategic partners is that at what point in the life of the technology company are are the new ventures getting involved with strategics? How early is it? How many are they actually able to manage? Uh, are they in the, is it you pick one from column A, one from column B, or are people actually trying to manage a bunch uh, at the same time or, or split it up on a global basis? Um, what happens in running a company uh, with strategic partners in clean tech? Is it any different than any other kind of business um, with strategic partners in terms of how the decisions are being made on a day-to-day -day basis within the company or or at the board level? I mean, what kind of considerations are given to, you know, down the road, uh, where th what the company direction is going to be? Um, and um, also, with regards to fundraising, we've talked a lot about you know the, the cost of scaling these. Are the strategics really uh, there uh, as a placeholder for future uh, fundraising uh, rounds? And um, are they actually being recruited in a way to either reduce the amount of uh, capital that's looking to be invested um, or to uh, write checks uh, for, for the future? If, if you could comment on that. Thank you. It, I guess, uh, I, Constellation is clearly a strategic investor. Um, and, and even among strategic investors, you know, um, some strategic investors have a purely an ROE focus. At Constellation, it's we're sort of dual goal. It's, it's ROE for the investment, but also uh, strategic fit within the company, something that complements our, one of our business units is something we would never 
um, usually never think of developing in-house. Um, we do do some venture investing, um, and interestingly enough, all the ones we've done to date have been in conjunction with both another strategic and a, a venture or uh, more uh, private equity type uh, um, uh, partner as well. So we typically uh, like to have uh, a VC or other involved in the transaction um, because you know it, it, they bring the expertise of helping the company manage uh, the growth, which we're not as experienced in. Um, Constellation feels like you know we add value to those kind of transactions because we understand markets. We also own a lot of customers, and we can help uh, um, inform uh, how th the technology or the product can actually address certain customer segments uh, better than it is today and actually bring you to those customers um, you know, w once we're a strategic investor. So um, I'll answer, your questions are always multiple parts. I'll answer at least one of them, which is the, the strategics. <laughs> it, from our perspective, we like to have partners. Um, the feedback we've got from companies so far has been pretty good, although I'll uh, I'll leave that for our, our entrepreneur to, to, to really get into how he how he views that, um, and uh, we also having a having a, a venture partner who also is experienced in bringing that company up to the growth scale is usually. <coughs> well, I've been on both sides of this. When I was at Air Products, I was responsible for making and running strategic investments in startup companies, and I'm on the other side of that, soliciting strategics. And what I can tell you is that. Uh, it, what you have to be very careful about is at what stage you bring a strategic in. It has to be the right strategic investor at the right time for you. And small companies, startup companies do make significant changes. You zag when everybody thought you were going to zig. And there are times when you're going down one path and you entirely flip over to another. And if your strategic investor was interested in the result when you got further down this line, but then you wind up over here, <laughs> the, 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 then you have a mismatch brewing. And the problem with strategic investments is that they typically don't have an exit strategy built into them. Once, a, once somebody puts their money in with you, they're stuck until your company exits. And if you've changed your business model, changed your technology focus, changed where you're going, now you've got a strategic investor who's basically a boat anchor for you, or rather you're a boat anchor for them. Uh, and the opposite happens too. In most large corporations, most people don't sit in the same chair for more than two, three years. So the person who led the investment in your company and thought it was such a great idea uh, is not going to be there if you're talking, as Zach said, where you're investing in a five and a seven and a ten year uh, horizon. Well, the average tenure of most people in large corporations in a position is about two and a half years. And so what was strategically aligned is now an albatross that somebody else inherits and has to and has to figure out some way to unwind. Investing in a startup company, it's a pretty sticky decision. You're, you, you are stuck with it for a long time. And so you have to make sure you don't bring that strategic in until it is clear that you're ready for one and that there is going to be a good match and that the variance in where you're likely to go with your company is still going to be aligned with that company down the road. And I was hoping to keep my lawyer hat off the whole time, but I can't resist. So it's so if you do bring a strategic in, which I, I tend, particularly in in Larry's case, I fully support bringing a strategic in. It's, it is the right time. Um, it, obviously, well, I say I, it, it has to be a minority interest. Otherwise, the VC investors are just stuck, which we won't accept. Um, and you also never want that strategic to be on your board. I say never. I mean, it, it's very dicey for that strategic investor to be on your board. Uh, because you're talking about things that could be competitive with them. Um, and uh, if they're a board observer, that's okay. You just have to excuse them from the meeting. Uh, but, but having them actually on the board could be a challenge. So, so be careful about that when you're asked by your strategics um, that they want a board seat. You should really discuss that thoroughly with your existing board members because it could be a problem. Um, and, and likewise, I mean, if you have a, a strategic that's coming in, you know, oftentimes they'll ask for exclusivity for a certain field of use of, of the product, which again, I think is okay. Um, I'm going to want them to pay for that uh, up front in addition to their investment. Um, but as long as the field of use is small enough and it's not going to constrain the company being sold, which is the most likely outcome, as you probably know, f uh, for an exit, I also think that's okay. So it's, it's, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of strategic investors and we've had exactly, I think, zero in our <laughs> portfolio. Um, but I'm a big fan if they show up with the right terms.
Uh, so we have um, a clearly articulated policy at Kleiner to actively build relationships with strategics and uh, also to build relationships with their venture investing entities. And we find them to be highly uh, uh, valuable partners for us in understanding the markets and the landscape of green tech and um, helping us with ventures at the right stage to have the right set of conversations with the market. It's much easier to do that with a venture investor. At the same time, uh, sorry, with a strategic investor. Also, at the same time, bringing in a strategic at the right stage, as, as Larry was saying, is it's critical to pick the right stage. And um, they do give a, um, a credibility stamp to the venture in its conversations with the market that is very valuable. Um, and they also give access to the market in many uh, green tech um, innovations. Access to the market is, is not through a short value chain and it's not simple. And strategics bring a tremendous amount of value there. Um, yeah, I think my colleagues said pretty much everything else. Yeah, you know, just one quick thing to add to that is that um, they bring a lot of vil validity to the market, but they also bring a lot of validity to other investors, and I, which is also significant to think about. I mean, if, if you have a strategic, they typically won't lead a round, okay? I mean, it's very uncommon for them to lead a round um, in terms of pricing the round. But they say, yeah, I want in. Go find us the financial lead. And if you're lucky, that strategic will actually go with you. It's very rare, but they will go with you, with the company, to the VC meetings and say, we love this company. This is why you should be investing in it, because we think it's great. And that, that's it's, it's awesome, that, um, awesome validation, if you can actually make that happen. So I did have a major auto OEM go with me to David's colleague's office last week, and we'll see what impact that has on <laughs> <laughs> uh, it. Yeah. But, but one thing you have to, uh, we, we, we're throwing around words up here like China this and India that and strategics this, and, and there's a temptation to think of companies because everybody's got the same logo on their business card to some monolithic interest. Most large companies are large because they're operating companies, and 98.5% of the people with that logo on their business cards are involved in operating existing businesses and building technology for those existing businesses. When you approach a strategic as a startup, you're dealing with the people in that company who are dedicated to innovation and new things. And for them to go outside their company for technology and partnerships is to admit to some extent that what's inside the company isn't good enough. And there is somebody, some large entrenched organization within that company that's going to resist that. And you will wind up in pitch meetings, and I've been again on both sides of this, where you have a technical organization just throwing stones at, at, at this saying, there's nothing new here. I don't see anything new. They're not telling me anything we can't do ourselves. And you have to overcome that activation energy to get anything to go as well. You need a champion within that organization who is willing to stand up to the technical organization, which is going to be basically the gatekeeper saying, there's nothing here we can't do ourselves. Isn't that a sales problem, too? Is that a what? sales problem, too? Not invented here? Uh, it depends. Uh, you know, the, the thing that you have to look for from a startup standpoint is a customer that's desperate. Because let's face it, if you're a large cor corporation and you're looking to do business with 20 guys in Ithaca, there's got to be something really wrong out there for you to wind up at my door. <laughs> you have to have tried everything else and nothing worked. Uh, and to a great extent, I mean, that is the sales issue, the business development issue for a startup, is to find desperation or to create it in the customers that you want to serve. And sometimes you can find that desperation in very large companies that truly haven't been able to get down a path and are open to something outside. But it's got to be a level of desperation that overcomes that, that, that internal uh, white cell count. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. I mean, Jeff Immelt is on record as saying, we're not very good at taking things from zero to 50 million in revenue. We're really good at taking them from 50 million to 500 million and up. And I think a lot of other American corporate chieftains feel the same way, that their organizations are not built for innovation, and they're happy to look for innovation outside, but then you have the problem you encounter. So you should never pitch to the engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's strategics with you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'll reiterate Dave's comment. I, for, for a constellation perspective, um, 
we're ready to engage the outside world with, with innovation. I think we we understand that it's something we're going to need to do to be able to be competitive in the future. We also recognize that you know we're not it's not our core competency. We at, at the end of the day we we're our core competency is commodity markets and understanding uh, power markets in North America. Um, Innovation, helping companies grow from zero to 50 or, or, or whatever it is, not our core competency. But we realize we have to have that. We have to have those products in order to stay relevant as this industry changes over the next, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. Um, just I want to make one comment. It's that strategics, in my view, are necessary for clean tech to scale the growth. Because in general, most clean tech, as we know, is very capital intensive. And what you need to scale is a balance sheet. And startups don't have balance sheets, and most investment funds can't allocate that much capital to one investment. Thank you. Well, one thing just to clarify, when you say it's got to be at the right time, is there a time that it's either too early um, for a company to get a strategic? Uh, one of the issues we've talked about is the volatility of the, of the plan, what direction the company is going in. Is that, is that the timing, the key timing issue, or is it, is it there another and, and is that about, you know, you have, to, you have to wait until you've, you know, gone through an A or B or you've already got some customers before you get a strategic or, you know, when you say the timing is so key, what, what, what is that? Uh, I, I can really only answer that from the perspective of my company. When I joined this company three years ago, it already had four years under its belt mm -hmm. and had explored the application of the technology to everything from semiconductors and uh, liquid crystal displays and ceramics and batteries and elsewhere. <coughs> and if you align with a strategic who has very broad interests, well, possibly there's a way to do that early. And we looked at some companies like GE and others that did have very broad interests like that. Uh, but it, it, it really was, in my mind, much too early until that you were within a, a narrower window of variance of where the business model was going to go. At the stage where we are now, where we have a technology that we feel is proven <coughs> for the battery industry and specifically the automotive industry's needs from its battery suppliers, bringing in an auto OEM saying, I need this to drive costs down in my value chain and I will facilitate partnerships with this company with all of the companies that are striving to serve that auto OEM's need. For me, this is the ideal time right now to bring in that strategic. So it's really, it's really a judgment call venture by venture, assessing the extent to which the venture has been de-risked and really can even use the the benefits that the strategic investor brings to the table. So I don't think you can have a one-size-fits-all answer. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to move on to another topic, which is the which is the role of government. Uh, in New York, we've got an active city uh, government. We've got the the also the state and then the federal government. Uh, we've got different agencies within the federal government that are having different roles, including you know, trying to grow exports, trying to fund uh, energy technology development and hit certain technical milestones within areas of clean tech. Uh, there's also the roles of uh, foreign governments, as we talked a little bit about, with uh, either the, um, the plans or the, um, uh, or the regulations <coughs> that they have within their own markets. Uh, and I'd like to uh, understand your perspective on the role going forward now. We've, we've just come through the whole AARA Recovery Act financing, and wh where do you see the role of government going forward now within the scaling to growth? Go ahead. Uh, I'll step on the landmine first. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll stay away from uh, sort of rebates and subsidies and, and that whole uh, – which ha serves, serves its purpose in the market, and I'll talk about um, um, policy around uh, uh, openness of markets. Um, this is actually something Dave hinted at earlier. Constellation is obviously a big advocate for <coughs> competitive markets. Um, it, it, that kind of structure and design where we're competing to provide uh, retail power to entities, it, it really it, it forces us to, to become more nimble, to accept more innovation, um, to to you know look for those new products we can bring to the, the customer base who's already buying commodity from us. Now, this is a clean tech panel. You're hearing me say I, I'm always talking about things that are really almost generation oriented. But but we you know in Constellation we think about things like energy efficiency, things like de demand response. Um, that we you know these are new types of products 
we want to bring to our customer base that, that buy uh, you know power or gas commodity from us today. And the reason we're doing this now is because we believe in competitive markets, we believe in the future of competitive markets, and to the extent that more markets were open, you'd see more, I think you'd see more companies taking the same approach, and, uh, and that I think could benefit the industry as a whole. Um, so I think it's really a matter of societal consensus. I mean, the EU countries have decided that global warming is real and that they want to reduce their carbon footprint, and so they are not without struggle and, and agitation trying to find the right blend of policies that will drive innovation and adoption there um, through financial carrots. Um, China has spotted a business opportunity as well as seeing solutions to some of their own conventional pollution problems. And so they have a set of policies in place using uh, public sector funding to drive uh, sustainable energy technologies. Uh, India is not so sure. They think they like it. And uh, America changes its mind every year or two. And uh, sometimes we throw a lot of money at it, and then other times we recoil in horror and say, oh my god, we, we just have to keep using those cheap hydrocarbons. And so I think that we're not going to see a truly consistent financial approach to the challenges of um, driving renewable energy technologies down the cost curve until we have a societal consensus in this country. But there's no question that it can be done. Um, and there is plenty of evidence to show that these technologies do go down the cost curve just as fast as any other one historically has. And uh, what we run the risk of doing at this point is having American innovations uh, manufactured in China and sold back to us. And uh, that's what our government can prevent if it will drive uh, innovation in this country, the exploitation of innovation in this country, rather than being break gas, break gas with uh, that policy. But, but that's exactly what happened in the case of lithium batteries. All of the basic technology was invented at places like Bell Labs, the University of Texas, uh, uh, the Argonne National Lab at, uh, under the DOE system. The basic patents all have names like John Goodenough and Stan Whittingham and, and so forth. But the companies that actually built the plants and developed the technology lead in manufacturing and such were Panasonic, Sanyo, Sony, LG, Samsung, and now a handful of Chinese companies as well, to the point where well over 98% of the world's lithium batteries now are manufactured in Korea, China, Japan, and Taiwan. So you mentioned the stimulus plan, and there was $2 billion in the stimulus plan uh, put into U.S. manufacturing of advanced batteries. And the government spread that wisely across everything from the base raw materials ore sources through to cell manufacturing and pack manufacturing and, and, and the vehicles. Two billion dollars is the <coughs> price of about three world-scale battery plants, and Panasonic builds two a year. Uh, <coughs> The, the scale of the investment on, a, on, a, on an industrial policy basis is dramatic, and it's far beyond the U.S. government and the state government's appetite for funding that kind of thing. Uh, you know, compare that, again, to China, where the government has set out a very clear 10-year plan that within, uh, by 2020, there will be, I think it's either three or five million electric vehicles per year being built in China by Chinese manufacturers. <laughs> And they, they, will ha they have targets for how many will be on the road at every point. And there is capital subsidy and R&D subsidy and all of those things going on to create that. That's what you're up against here if you're talking about it from an industrial policy standpoint in the U.S. And the $2 billion, and as controversial as that was, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what's going on in Korea, China, Japan. Yeah, and mo <clears throat> most of that $2 million. Billion. Billion. I'm sorry, billion. <laughs> How many, how many millions, Larry, went to startups? Uh, there was exactly one uh, small company that wasn't even making battery products. They are making capacitors, and they, they somehow got thrown in there. Yep. And of those recipients, actually, uh, of the, the money going to the battery industry, a very significant percentage of it went to, let's see, BASF, Toda Kogyo out of Japan, uh, LG A Chemical out of Korea. A123? Uh, no. At, there were U.S. Yeah. companies on the list, absolutely, Johnson Controls and A123, uh, but 
if you want to su uh, support the construction of battery plants and battery materials plants, the companies with that expertise today in this world are not U.S. companies. So when, when Larry's company presented his board, which I'm on, with a big, thick application for the funding, we all said, that looks really nice. <laughs> and then, I mean, I, I don't, I, my, my view of this is uh, the U.S. government um, is a little bit too inefficient to help startups. Uh, I mean, there are grants, and there's nice sort of grants, for example, at, at a, which, are, which are all great. I mean, um, but when it comes to real grant money, you know, it's not something that the, uh, that a VC, in my experience, at least not in my own personal view, ever banks on. And if the company's banking on it, it's not really a VC backable company. And we just if if it, it's like an added bonus to use a f phrase I probably had in college or something. You know, if if it, if the money comes in, it's an added bonus. I just never count on it ever getting there. David, um, I think my view on this is not what should government do. What can government do? Uh, I think government can impact funding, but uh, you have to ask, does the U.S. government have the, the appetite or ability to fund X billion more to match other economies to fund clean tech growth? I think you, they can also provide regulatory certainty, but you have to also ask yourself, does the current legislative system in the U.S. government come to agreement on any major issues, let alone clean tech or energy issues, and then finally, you know, the, the seat of the government can be a bully <coughs> pulpit. And right now, you know, does our executive branch have enough political capital to push a clean tech agenda? I mean, the opportunity to do that was during Copenhagen, but they chose to go for health care. Carol Browner resigned today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great news. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I highly recommend John Stewart's bit where he shows eight U.S. presidents in a row pledging to get us off foreign oil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to bring it back to innovation, though, and I know, Mary, one of the other topics you want is what can government do? Mm -hmm. There was one aspect of the stimulus, that the way the grant was written, which was very effective for small companies, and, and in particular for us, even though we did not get one of the grants, because they drew a line of you know, uh, established companies and did not really fund below that. But one of the things that was written into that grant, uh, the, the, the request for proposal, was that they encouraged applicants to develop partnerships with other domestic manufacturers. And that's all it said. It didn't say it was going to be a criteria for judgment. It didn't say anything other than that you were encouraged to partner with other domestic companies. And that alone fostered a lot of conversations and a lot of companies because there were uh, 85 or 90 companies applying for that $2 billion, it got the phone answered for us in a lot of places that wouldn't have happened otherwise and got us in front of large companies like a Johnson Controls or an A123 and others that did eventually get money out of this that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So if you think about from a state government standpoint, if New York State is supporting GE and putting in a plant uh, 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 or submitting proposals, uh, requests for proposals for, for state funding, Simply asking the question in, in the application, what are you doing to partner with small companies in the state of New York? That applications that have partnerships with a small company in the domiciled in the state of New York will receive yeah, a second review or a more favorable review. That alone catalyzes conversations that, that otherwise aren't going to happen. I tried to put that in front of Governor Patterson when I was uh, had one chance to see him. It, it didn't go very far, but uh, try uh, I'll try it again. But one of the questions that's been uh, been asked is uh, is about the the New York uh, infrastructure itself for entrepreneurs. Um, I think that uh, uh, Larry, you've just suggested one thing that could be of help to uh, improve. Uh, prospects or opportunities for New York entrepreneurs. Does anybody else have any other suggestions for what could be done uh, within the New York State environment to assist uh, clean tech entrepreneurs? Come on. <laughs> uh, money? Uh, what's, what's the, is it a trick, is it a trick question? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not money. a trick question. Money, I mean, they could money. just fund more startups. Okay. And by that, I mean they could, you know, the pension plan could be, could, I mean, they, they talk really, I mean, there was just a NYSERDA program, was it NYSERDA that was just announced today, I think, 
or yesterday. Two hundred fifty million. So, so I read the release and I read the, th and I, it's all for power generation. So, which is great for some people. Okay, I mean it's for power generation facilities. Well, there aren't that many startups that are going to be doing power generation facilities because they're way too capital intensive. It'd be helpful if the two hundred fifty million dollars was for, you know, two million dollars for this company to do X and Y. I mean things that VCs actually. I'm, I'm biased, but you know things that VCs really care about and that really create lots of jobs. Um, that'd be awesome. Uh, I think uh, one thing that could usefully be done by some of the state bodies is to act as clearinghouses for regional uh, universities and uh, technologists and entrepreneurs. Uh, there's an effort called New York Best, and I've forgotten what it stands for, but it's battery basically, uh, yeah, it's, it's a clearinghouse for all work related to batteries. Because what's happened uh, from my perspective in this region is that the, um, the research efforts have become uh, highly siloed. And uh, I see a lot of scientists doing um, incremental or tangential work uh, rather than working out at the boundaries of the possible to make real uh, uh, important innovation possible. And only by uh, fostering an exchange of information do you get the right people working on the right things. So I think the state can do that. Do you have a model of where that's going on effectively? Silicon Valley. <laughs> I, I think one of the things to keep in mind, though, is that you know, research funding is typically within a state's budgetary constraints. But the point at which you really create jobs is when that research is translated to the plant floor. And I, I have to give a shout out to our congressman in Ithaca, Maurice Hinchy, who recognized that and he helped get us involved in uh, research programs with the Department of Defense, which has critical issues re related to energy, uh, batteries, energy storage. And the research that we were able to do under those programs, we're also able to apply in a pilot plant that creates operator jobs and that's what gets their attention and that's what gets you know, your congressman to your groundbreaking ceremony. It's not that you've got two professors and an entrepreneur working on, on a startup in a laboratory. It's the point where you start hiring dozens of people to actually take that to the floor. And, and in fact, to the point where you know, at, at one of his press conferences when I was telling the congressman that we were going forward and starting to hire operators, he actually grabbed bodily one of the reporters by the arm and pulled her over and said, this is the way it's supposed to work. This is why we fund R&D, because funding R&D locally translates then into manufacturing locally. And I'll, I'll take one more shot at it, which is um, copying success as a proven methodology. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this at my firm for 39 years. Mm -hmm. And every time one of us gets on the airplane, someone always asks the question, how many billion dollar companies have come out of Boston or New York in life sciences or information technology or green tech in the last 39 years versus how many came out of Silicon Valley? Mm -hmm. What's the answer? Uh, I think three out of Boston, none out of New York. I think the one thing I would ask for in, for, the, for the New York state government and state governments in general is to have a, a single clean regulatory playing field. I think the issues around permitting to just get solar panels in your roof or a residential wind turbine in your home, these are mind-numbingly difficult. And I think these are things that should be bipartisan and whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you can rectify. And I'm sure there are 101 other legislations that can be cleaned up. And actually, I'd like to kind of also give a shout out to a friend, Micah Koch at um, NYC Acre, where they're creating a clean tech incubator in New York City, where they're basically giving a home and providing infrastructure for the clean tech entrepreneurs of New York in order for them to better scale their businesses. And I think the life of an entrepreneur is probably the hardest life uh, anyone can have. And if you can make their life easier by giving them access to experts, back office support, marketing, I think that can help stimulate innovation um, in New York. We've heard a lot of the, um, the sort of th the challenges. So where's the success in clean tech right now? All my ventures are in stealth mode, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the legacy of my firm is that we swing for the fences. And uh, as I was touching on earlier, we, we don't invest in incremental innovation. We seek to find innovations that are out of the boundaries of the possible technologically or in terms of uh, adoption or tipping points in behavior. 
And we feel that those are the kinds of ventures that are going to um, create energy sustainability and create wealth in the future. Um, so we, we have one of those that had a successful IPO uh, last year, Amaris Biotechnologies. Um, and um, what, watch this space over the next um, 20 to 30 months. Should be very interesting. Uh, no, wa watch the Kleiner Perkins portfolio over the next 20 to 30 months. It's, we, we believe it will be very interesting. Any other comments about this? The, the good news in uh, clean tech. I've been looking at clean tech for the last 10 years. And back in 2000, you couldn't get a room of this many people to discuss it. You couldn't really talk about this on your CV. And that even strategics even have this in vocabulary, and they're actually looking at it. And there are now specialized funds focusing on clean tech, and generalist funds like Client Perks looking at it. I think that's a huge success. I mean, I think in the last five years, about 20 billion has been invested in clean tech and over a thousand transactions. That's a success. This is a bit of an unfair question, Lawrence Poster. Uh, this is directed to you, David. Uh, if you found yourself controlling a regulated utility, if you found yourself controlling a regulated utility, would you adopt their mindset, or would you do something disruptive? And if the latter, which I hope is the answer, what would that be? Uh, the question was, if I w suddenly woke up tomorrow morning and I was the head of a regulated utility, <coughs> would my mind switch over to keep the lights on, or would it, would it remain uh, in the innovative stance that I have today? And uh, why well, I make it a habit not to answer wild hypothetical questions <laughs> like that. <laughs> If I were in such a position of responsibility to my shareholders and uh, beholden to a regulatory regime, I would probably fall into that mindset pretty fast. Just guessing. Well, how, what would you say is needed for American companies, American corporations to compete with the um, expertise or the um, capital that a lot of the Asian counterparts have? Okay. <coughs> hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'll, again, I'll, I'll stay back with the, with the lithium battery industry. And, and the, the example I'll give you is that the industries go through phases in terms of what's, where is the high ground. And at a certain point, the high ground is at the R&D end. It's, it's developing the new molecule. It's developing the new, the new technology at the front end. But as I said before, the job creation is when that's translated to the plant floor, and you have to have both. And U.S. industry and U.S. academia have done a very good job of developing the molecule, but not as good a job of keeping the manufacturing technology here. And I, I see that in our industry, again, that if you want to set up a battery manufacturing line, you're going to Japan or to Korea to buy it, because that's where that technology is right now. Uh, and, and it's the entire infrastructure from tool making and integration and engineering and all of those disciplines beyond those in the laboratory at R&D where you truly get, in my mind, the economic benefit and the, economic, uh, the, the, the virtuous cycle of job creation going on. Does anybody on the panel have any hope that before the next presidential election there might be some meaningful energy legislation coming out of Congress and then a corollary for the uh, investors on the panel in, in terms of looking at new business opportunities, do you actively shy away from companies that have a very high degree of policy dependency? I won't offer any predictions, per se, on legislation in the U.S. Um, in terms of hopes. I, I think everyone recognizes, you know, carbon legislation is probably not something to hope for. Um, but, a, a, you know, a federal RPS standard that, that both normalizes the standard across states, um, but also provides, you know, uh, especially if it were a longer-term certainty as to how those things would be valued, I think would be, um, I think it's a, a Potential, uh, you know, as a as a as a bridge between the two divide, you know, the, the, the two sides of contra uh, Congress. Um, I I won't predict it, but I'll, I'll offer that as at least something that that I would hope for. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, policy dependent investing is pretty scary. Um, there's it's completely out of your control, and we know how inefficient the process is for policy. Um, 
if, if a company gets lucky, like I'll give you an example, the same company, the particle board replacement company, um, I mean, California recently has legislated that particle board that manufacturers use in certain applications that are inside a home have to be formaldehyde free. That's awesome. <laughs> it, it wasn't why we invested in the company. Okay, but, but that, and that's an awesome development. And I hope that every other state does the same thing and I hope the U.S. government does the same thing nationally. I, I doubt it will ever happen like that. Um, so I think it, from my perspective, it's just more of an opportunistic thing. I mean, if, it, if you can take advantage of some policy that's probably already in place, that's great. Um, betting on a certain policy to happen, it's not for me. My name is Michael Gilbert. We spent a lot of the evening speaking, I think, almost exclusively about energy, with the exception of Zach's uh, last comment. I wonder if you could comment on the landscape in terms of waste, water, and uh, agriculture, and where you see that in terms of the clean tech, clean tech uh, spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so we have investments in each of those sectors. Um, ag bio is uh, a huge opportunity. The demand for food on, on the planet is uh, not likely to decline, and we're asking ever more productivity from ever fewer resources. Um, hu huge opportunities there, and um, lots of collateral and peripheral opportunities around the threats and challenges of ag and bio. Um, uh, water, certainly. M massive crisis there. The, the answer for the developed world is one that's going to be, uh, again, my favorite word for the night, one of those decadal solutions. There's no way developed, uh, developed geographies like Western Europe and the United States are going to solve their water problems without water reuse, and that's going to be really hard for people to get used to, um, but it's going to happen because we can't solve the problems otherwise. Um, but there are certainly some very interesting innovative technologies in the pipeline in water. Um, what was your third category? Uh, waste. 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 Um, yeah, so municipal solid waste is uh, 260 million tons a year in the United States. And then we have another, uh, I think, uh, close to 300 million tons of uh, ag waste and uh, forestry residue. Um, it's really a huge pile of resources is what it is. And we've been looking at um, at the landscape that way for a number of years now, we see garbage as piles of resources. And so we're looking for the best technologies to convert those resources back to reuse. And uh, we have a very significant investment in that area, which uh, has been uh, very successful and growing very fast. I just want to comment um, and make a suggestion if possible, because um, I heard two different views, one stating for here in New York, um, Ideally, more money could be uh, sent by the state into this industry. And also, there's a suggestion for some sort of universal regula regulatory code. Um, working here in New York, um, although we are very much a global company, but our presence being here, we get tons of inquiries all throughout the city, tons of interest um, all throughout the city for our wind energy products. Um, and from our perspective, uh, the biggest impediment would certainly be the combination of regulations, red tape, permitting uh, certifications. So although the demand is extremely high um, and people really want them, they're just not willing to invest the time and the energy and the headache in getting through all this. And therefore, the majority of our products are being sold in places like the Caribbean, uh, in South America, um, where there's no headaches and it's a quick, very quick process. Um, so if anyone is able to help get rid of these certifications and whatnot in New York, please push that forward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just had a quick question. Uh, Marcus and I work for the DB Mazdar Clean Tech Fund. Um, you guys talked a little bit about customers and you know you need a customer in order to have a business. One thing to be interested to get your view on a little bit is also adoption of new products, right? I mean, a lot of you talking about kind of the new particle board. Well, it's new. You got to get someone. You got to get some builder, some designer to, to believe that it actually is going to be good and is going to work, and do the same thing Particle Board does. It'd be great to get some commentary around how do you spur adoption of a product? How do you try to understand what the risks are associated with adoption? So, not an easy question, but it'd be great. it's got to solve a problem and be cheaper. <laughs> I mean, so this 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 product that this company has, 
I mean, a, a flat eight by four piece of particle board is cheaper than a flat piece of E2E board. But what E2E can do is literally compression mold the product to form shapes, like a chair. Um, or like l it can look like it already has molding on it. It's, so the compression, sh the compression shaping saves a whole boatload of labor cost and raw material cost. So now the product is cheaper. So it's, it's no different than any other business model. <laughs> I hate to say. Compete with performance and people not believing. Oh, yeah. It's more a question of how do you, how do you get people to buy in. They, they, you give them samples and they test it for a year. So we're funding companies that are obviously not profitable. That's what VCs do at the beginning. Um, so, I mean, yeah, people test it and they put their screws in and see, oh, yeah, this is stronger than steel. With some of the product is stronger than steel. It's actually incredible. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't really think it's that much different. You don't have to have a good product that's solving a problem and typically is cheaper. Saves the customer some money. I, I just have to say improved performance is the, the worst mirage you can ever chase. Because if you have a product that's better than anything that's on the market today in terms of performance, then chances are the amenable market for it is essentially zero. And if you go to a company with an improved performance product, you're going to go in through the R&D organization. And you'll likely never come out. What you want to do is be talking to the guy in manufacturing who's got a problem that you can solve for them on a plant floor where there is a, 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 a tangible cost saving that they can take. And for me, that was one of the, one of the big you know, revelation moments for me when I finally realized that we were completely wasting our time pitching the high performance that our process can impart to, in this case, battery materials. Because that was a ticket to an endless R&D labyrinth. And what we started doing instead is strictly going in on cost savings, capacity deployment, rapid deployment, rapid to scale for things that they're already using. We'll let them figure out on their own that the performance is higher when they buy what comes out of our process. They'll figure that out eventually. Mm -hmm. And we will charge for it eventually. But if you try to charge for it on day one, you, you will be, you'll be stuck in somebody's R&D department for the rest of your life. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. They're great questions. It's been a wonderful panel. Thank you for joining us. Uh